Hi all, and welcome to a new Ordina meetup. Uh, today we're talking about structural pattern matching in Python. And this will be, uh, yeah, we, we've got the Python, uh, Python label at Ordina. And one of our Pythoneers, uh, Sebastian Zeef, uh, will be talking you through it. It's still an alpha feature, so it might take a while. Uh, but without further ado, uh, Here's Sebastian. Uh, you Hello. might recognize him from the from the Python Discord server. And um, yeah, I just want to, to wish you good luck and uh, have fun. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's still an alpha feature. Uh, it will be released in uh, Python 3.10, uh, which should will be released in October, probably in the fall of this year. Um, so you don't have to wait for too long. And if you already want to play with it, uh, you can download the alpha release or the next beta release, which will be released in May. Um, so this is structural pattern matching. Um, and I'd like to start uh, with a quote from Larry Hastings. And the reason that I want to do this is because this feature made quite a splash in the Python community. Uh, it's not a completely uncontroversial feature. Um, and I think, uh, uh, and I've read a lot of commentary and I've read a lot of discussions about it. Uh, and I'm not really interested in uh, 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 being before or against it per se, but some people make excellent points while discussing the feature. And I think Larry Hastings uh, did just that. Um, now, before I start, I would like to explain the context of the quote, uh, because I don't quite like it when people forget to mention the context and just cite someone out of context. Uh, so Larry Hastings is a, a Python core developer and he replied to a thread opened by Brad Cannon, uh, who is a member of the Python Steering Council on discuss.python.org. Uh, and this thread was opened in November 2020 to ask for the uh, opinions of Python committers uh, on the inclusion of structural pattern matching in a Python. And this is what Larry wrote as part of a larger uh, a message. He said that, um, I see the match statement as a domain-specific language contrived to look like Python and to be used inside of Python, but with very different semantics. Uh, when you enter a PEP 634 match statements, the rules of the language uh, change completely and code that looks like existing Python code does something surprisingly very different. Um, now, I don't really want to uh, uh, focus on the sentiment here, but I want to focus on two points that he's making here. Uh, and these are the two points. And the first is domain-specific language. Um, when we're talking about structural pattern matching, uh, this feature will really introduce another mini language into Python. We already have the string formatting mini language that you can use to format strings. Uh, and this will be another that will be added to the language. Uh, and it allows us to, to specify patterns uh, that we're trying to match something to. Um, so for those of you who haven't really looked at the new feature yet, we really need to learn uh, a new mini language if we really want to understand this feature. The second point is also important, uh, and that is that this new mini language looks like Python, and it probably feels like the Python you already know, but it behaves differently. Um, and well, what this means is that your intuitions that you've built over the years, uh, they may not hold for match patterns. Uh, this means that if you scan match patterns without really having learned anything about them, you may jump to the wrong conclusions about what that piece of code will do. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to be aware that match patterns have their own semantics. Um, now, at the same time, uh, I realized that I, I've now made it seem that uh, structural pattern matching is not Python, but there's also an important but here. And that but is, but it's still Python. It is Python. It will be part of Python. So Python 3.10 will be released in uh, in October or thereabouts. Um, and uh, while I'm not going to pretend that I'm suddenly an expert in structural uh, uh, pattern matching, uh, I've only played around it, uh, with it uh, for a bit, I can tell you that it's very powerful. Um, so. I think it's important for all of us to just uh, go into it with an open mind, uh, to look at it, uh, and maybe to, 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 tr to just try and understand it and use it a couple of times and to play with it. Um, that it's such a big feature also means that this talk will not be a comprehensive overview of everything there is to know about structural pattern matching. 
Uh, I don't think that's fair to you all. Uh, that would mean a, a really big uh, information overload. Uh, and we probably would be sitting here next weekend still. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction. I want to tell you uh, what it is, how it feels, how you can use it, and hopefully give you a bit of a mental framework uh, that will help you get started with it. Well, before we do that, uh, I also have a little bit of a, a personal introduction for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm Sebastian, uh, I'm 34 years old. And um, as was already mentioned, I work as a software engineer for the Ordina Pythoneers. I haven't been working for Ordina for that long. Uh, I started uh, at the start of this year actually, uh, but so far I'm really enjoying um, working at Ordina. I think it's great to work with a lot of people who are very passionate about Python, that you can discuss Python with, that you can learn from. Uh, and it really uh, has made me a better programmer already. And I think that's really important. Um, I'm also one of the owners of, of Python Discord. Uh, uh, we, are, we have three owners there. I don't really like the term owner, but that's uh, Discord terminology. Um, and we try to uh, provide a, a learning environment for everyone who wants to learn Python or just wants to discuss Python. Uh, but we also organize Python related events and we try to help other organizations in the Python ecosystem with doing their thing, basically. Uh, additionally, I, do, I also do a couple of other things. And, and one thing that I really like is EuroPython. Uh, I'm a, a volunteer for EuroPython, which is a Python conference that will take place at the end of July this year. It's all virtual. The entry bar is really low this year, so you should definitely just uh, join, uh, buy a ticket or get a ticket and, and join the uh, conference. Anyway, uh, let's talk about structural pattern matching. Um, so first, what does structural pattern matching actually do? And this is part one, and we're going to talk about matching by structure and by shape. And then very importantly, uh, a lot of people think that structural pattern matching is just a C-style switch statement. Now, for those of you who, who've never programmed in C, uh, this is what a, a C switch uh, uh, blocks look like. Uh, looks like. It's relatively straightforward. In this case, we have an HTTP status code, uh, and we're going to switch based on that code. And uh, we basically say uh, that we're going to match a literal 200. Uh, and if the status code matches that 200, we're going to print get an OK response from the server. And then there's a break after that so that we jump out of this block without executing all the other prints below that. Um, and by the way, that print is necessary here in C. Uh, otherwise, we jump to that case 200 and then execute every block after it as well. Um, as you can see, there's also default case uh, uh, down below. And that one matches if none of the other cases uh, have matched. Um, now, we can actually do this with structural pattern matching in Python. Um, it will look like this. Uh, and as you can see, there are no breaks here in this uh, piece of code. We don't need that in Python. Python will only execute the first case block that matches uh, uh, the, the target that you're trying to match. So as we can see here, we have the case 200, the case 404, and we have a special one, which is the underscore here. Uh, and that is a wildcard pattern. Uh, it matches everything and it doesn't do anything else. So this last block will always run if none of the other blocks have matched before it. Um, so this is a structural pattern matching, but this, if this was all there was, uh, structural pattern matching would never have been accepted into Python because, well, we could talk about maybe uh, having some opportunities for optimization, but basically you can already do this in Python. You can just use an if block. So this if block does the same. Um, and it's really easy to write. Uh, so if a structural pattern matching was all, uh, uh, was just a switch block, it would, it would never have uh, been accepted into Python because we already have these if blocks. Um, right. Um, so if we're not just uh, matching those literals, what is structural pattern matching in Python? Well, for that, uh, um, to understand that, we need to talk about uh, uh, shape and structure. So structural pattern matching tries to match objects uh, by their shape. Um, so what is the shape of an object? 
well, we could obviously get very metaphysical about it, um, but I think it's just good to look at a couple of examples. So um, here I wrote down uh, three objects. I gave them names so that we can talk about them. Uh, so we've got a 42, uh, we've got a list containing a few items, and we've got a dictionary here uh, with uh, uh, two key value pairs. So, and now I'd like to, to ask you, how would you describe the shape of these objects? So, um, and, and probably if this were an in-person meetup, I'd, I'd ask you to shout out your answers, uh, but I'd still like to ask you to take a few moments, a few seconds, and think about what you think the shapes of these objects are. What are the properties that define the shapes? Uh, what makes these objects to uh, what they are? So just think about that for a moment and then uh, we'll discuss that. Right. So let's compare our notes. I've just written down a few examples uh, uh, that, that you can think about. Well, first of all, uh, you probably know, you've probably noticed that they're all different types. So we've got an integer there at the top. We've got a list. We've got a dictionary. And I think if you're, you're talking about what makes an object an object, what's the shape of an object, then the type of that object um, is really uh, important to note. Oh, I forgot the order in which I uh, wrote these down. Um, I think what's also uh, a defining uh, factor of an object is just its value. If I know that the value of my integer is 42, and I basically know everything there is to know about that integer. One other thing um, that you can think about, if you have a sequence object, uh, how many elements does that sequence have? And maybe what kind of elements uh, um, do we have in that sequence, which could also define the shape uh, of the object. When you have a mapping object, like a dictionary, you could think about which keys does that mapping have? What key value pairs do we have? What's the length of, uh, of my mapping object? So we can think about a lot of uh, uh, um, properties that really define the shape of what that object is. Um, if, you, if you have other objects or basically any object in Python, you can think about what kind of attributes does this object have? Uh, and what are those attributes assigned to? What are the values that the, uh, uh, that, that the attributes of the object are assigned to? Um, so these are just a few examples uh, of ways in which you could define the shape of an object. Uh, and now we're going to try to write patterns to match objects by these uh, properties, by these shape properties. So how can we do that? Well, we can use a match statement. This is uh, a rough, uh, this is roughly the structure of a structural pattern matching statement. As you can see at the top, we have a match target. Uh, and there in that uh, target expression, you can, uh, um, which is also called a subject expression, you can specify the objects that we're going to try to match. Then we have several cases. We need at least one. Uh, and each case can have a pattern. And in that pattern, we can specify the kind of structure that we're looking for in the object. Uh, optionally, we could also have a, a guard clause uh, in our uh, uh, case, uh, in our case, uh, which is uh, another Boolean check um, that you can execute that has to evaluate to true to make that case block match. And finally, within each case, we have a block of code that will be executed. Um, and in Python, we simply match uh, the target from the top to the bottom. And when once we hit the first matching case block, we execute that block of code, and then we jump out of the uh, match statement. So this is the basic structure of a match statement. Now fill in some blanks. I'll leave out the guard statement for now. We'll get to that one later. Um, so here I have match my target. So my target is a name that's assigned to some kind of object somewhere. We don't know what, we're trying to match it. And uh, here we have a case and it says int, and then we have these parentheses. Well, this is an example of a class pattern. Um, 
We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about those later. This is just an initial example. But what this means is that, we're, that if the target is an integer, is an instance of the class integer, then this case will match. And then we will print my target is an instance of int. Well, if that isn't the case, but it is uh, uh, an instance of string, which is the, the str that you see here with the second case, uh, then we're going to print my target is an instance of str, the string. Well. So far, so good. Now let's add a guard statement just to show you what those are. So here I've slightly changed uh, um, uh, the, the match uh, statement. As you can see here, we now have a guard statement. And this is a simple check, like you already know from normal if statements. Uh, and only if this check succeeds, the case block will run. Um, now, one thing to note is that we will only ever run that guard if the original case a pattern already matches. So if we don't have an integer, we are never going to run my target bigger than 100. This could uh, be important if your guard uh, expression has side effects, like assigning a name with an assignment expression or a walrus operator. Um, so it, it doesn't always run. It will only run if the, uh, the pattern that you've specified uh, already matches. Um, so the guard adds that additional check. Um, if the check fails, the case does not match and we move on. So now in this case, the, the first case block uh, now tries to match integers, but the guards limits it to uh, integers that are larger than 100. The second case block is still looking for a string, uh, but it's looking for a string that has uh, exactly three characters. Um, Uh, uh, now, these kind of guard uh, uh, clauses are not really interesting yet, I think, but they will become interesting once we start talking about capture patterns in which we can actually capture some elements of the target and then use that in a guard statement. Right, so this is a match statement in general. I think it's now time to start talking about the patterns that we have. Um, now, I do want to warn you, I'm not going to, uh, 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 this is not going to be an exhaustive discussion of all the patterns and what you can do with them. Uh, that would, uh, not only would that keep us here for quite some time, uh, uh, as I said earlier, I think that would just be an information overload and I want to prevent that. Um, and I also want to reiterate that I'm not suddenly an expert in structural pattern matching. Uh, it's only been released, uh, uh, I think, two months ago with an alpha release. I've been playing around with it. I've been reading a lot about it, but I'm not yet an expert in structural pattern matching. Um, what I do want to give you is I want to explain the patterns to you, and I want to give you an idea of how the patterns work, how you can use them. Uh, I maybe want to subvert of your, some of your unhelpful intuitions uh, about uh, uh, Python and, and how Python works, uh, because as said earlier, uh, patterns are really a language onto their own. You have to learn the uh, semantics that belong to those patterns. Well, all right, let's start with a very easy one. Uh, this is a wildcard pattern, and uh, it's simply an underscore, as you can see here. And what this means is this will always match. It will match everything. So this case here will always match regardless of what the target is. Um, and it doesn't do anything else. It doesn't capture values. It doesn't extract information. It doesn't assign or bind names. The only thing it does is that it always matches. This also means that this case, this specific case here is a tautology. It always matches. Uh, and there's a, a, a special uh, protection for you in Python. Such a case must always come last. And the reason for that is if you have a case that always matches and you have cases beneath that, um, then those cases, uh, those case blocks become unreachable. The first one will already match and everything below that will not match anymore. So Python will throw a syntax error if uh, uh, your a tautological block isn't the last one in your match statement. Um, now, you may think that wildcard patterns are only useful for these default or else-like cases, like we've seen earlier, uh, but that's not actually the case uh, because patterns and the wildcard uh, pattern as well can be embedded uh, within other patterns. 
What we're going to see later is that you can actually build up a complex pattern consisting of multiple patterns that contain other patterns. And you can also use the wildcard pattern um, uh, inside of another pattern. So one thing that we're going to see later is that we're going to try to match a dictionary uh, or a mapping, I have to say. We're going to check for a key. And then we're going to say the key can be assigned to any value. And we're going to use the wildcard operator for that to say that the, the, the value of the value is not important to us. Um, so this is the wildcard pattern. Uh, it looks a little bit uh, like the capture pattern, which is uh, what we see here. I've replaced the underscore by just any random name, in this case, some name. And just like the wildcard pattern, the uh, a capture pattern always matches, which also means that the same rules for a tautology applies here. So uh, you cannot have uh, uh, a two capture, uh, two case patterns with only a capture pattern in a row because the, the, the top one will always match and the second one will become unreachable. So you get a syntax error again. Now, what will this uh, capture pattern do? It will just bind the name, some name, to whatever value uh, um, my target in this case has. So we'll see here, if we were to run this, then we will just uh, um, print I matched with and then the value of my targets because this always matches and we've bound the, the name, some name to the value of targets. Now note, you may think that the wildcard pattern is just a special case of the capture pattern, but with an underscore, that's not the case. A wildcard pattern is really something else that never binds a name. So, right. Um, you may have noticed that I've been using the term binding a name, uh, and that's kind of important. Uh, this is not actually the same as assigning a name. Uh, so you cannot assign to uh, attributes. You cannot assign to uh, uh, subscripts. You can only bind a name in the current scope to a value. That's what's going to happen. Uh, and as with all other patterns, you can nest a capture pattern within other patterns. Right. Now, this is uh, the literal pattern. We've actually seen this one before. This was the original um, example that we have. Uh, we're going to match uh, another target here. We just have a few literals that we want to match here. We see 100, we see hello, we see a Boolean true, uh, and just with a simple statement, a uh, simple print within the case block. Uh, we, we cannot mit, uh, match all literals. The, the literals that we can add are the numbers, including the complex numbers. Uh, we can uh, uh, match strings and then true, false, and none. Uh, numbers and strings are compared using equality, so A equals B. And the singleton literals, as they're called in the PEP, uh, are compared by identity, so A is B. And that's basically all there is to the literal pattern. And this most this just resembles that uh, C uh, C like switch statement. Um, there's also an OR pattern, and this one's really handy if you want to have a case uh, that matches uh, multiple potential uh, patterns. And the OR pattern works with a, a pipe character, so this a vertical bar that you see here. And now the first uh, case will match. 100 or 200 or 300 or 400. Um, doesn't matter which one of those matches, but it will match for all four literals. It's the same for hello and goodbye. And here you can see that we can also combine the literal pattern and none with the wildcard pattern, the underscore that you see in the third case. Um, so this is the or pattern. Now, if you're using, uh, if you're binding names within an or pattern, then each uh, alternative that you have must bind the same uh, set of names. Um, right, so this is the OR pattern, which is very useful. And now we get on to uh, something that's slightly more difficult. Now we get to the sequence pattern. Um, so what is a sequence pattern? Well, the sequence pattern uh, is, is, a, uh, is a pattern that consists of subpatterns, and those subpatterns are separated by commas. So as you can see here, in the first case that we have here, we see a literal pattern, a move, then a comma, 
Then we see a name. So this is a capture pattern direction. This just binds the name direction to whatever value uh, is the second value in my sequence. And then we also bind distance, uh, uh, the, the third element. Now this uh, sequence pattern um, matches uh, instances of collections.abc.sequence. So everything that uh, implements the sequence uh, API or interface, it won't match uh, strings, bytes, or byte arrays. So that's a catch. You have to remember that. Um, as you can see here, we have a list. It says move north 10. So, uh, and this is from a, a, a console RPG game, uh, something like that, where you can type in your commands. Uh, and in this case, uh, we match move. We uh, bind the direction to whatever direction we've specified in the command and we bind distance to whatever distance is specified in the command. And then we call the function move player direction distance. Um, now, if you don't like such a bare sequence uh, uh, um, pattern, you, you are also allowed to wrap it in uh, parentheses like this, just like with tuples. Um, so now you have a tuple look, but you have to remember this is still a sequence pattern. It will still match all sequences, except those three that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this really looks like a tuple, but it still matches all sequences, including the list that we have here. And for good measure, if you really want it, you can also uh, use square brackets to make it uh, look like a list, like we have here. Um, and uh, um, here we have just have a sequence pattern that matches a sequence of three elements, and uh, the elements are matched against the sub patterns that we specified for each of the three elements. Uh, so this is a sequence pattern. Uh, can we do something more interesting with it? Well, actually we can. What about a sequence pattern that does not have uh, a fixed number of elements? So as you can see here, we match any sequence that starts with cell and then has zero to infinitely many uh, uh, um, elements after it. All those elements will be packed into items. Items is just a capture uh, a pattern that's prefixed with the star, and that's uh, uh, like using uh, uh, the, 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 the tuple unpacking and packing in Python. So in this case, uh, if I were to, to have a command cell, sword, uh, uh, and shield, then items will be a list of uh, uh, sword and shield, and then we can sell them. Um, so this is really handy, uh, and this allows us to um, uh, match an arbitrary number of elements. Now that, just like with tuple unpacking, uh, that star uh, pattern doesn't have to be at the end. It can be in the middle as well. So what we see here is a travel command. Um, it will match um, a final destination at the end and all intermediate destinations will be packed into this intermediate list. Uh, and this intermediate list can be empty or there can be many intermediate uh, locations in this travel command. So now we're going to travel to all the intermediate locations and then finally the final destinations. Uh, the final destination, uh, the last element that has to be present here in uh, the sequence. Um, you can also combine it uh, with a wildcard pattern. In this case, uh, we just simply say we want to match the first and the last element in the sequence. They have to be there, and we don't really care if there's anything in between. So there can be zero items in between. There can be many items in between. We just uh, pack them all and we throw them away because this is a wildcard pattern and it doesn't bind any names. So we just dismiss whatever element happens to be between first and last. Um, there is one caveat that comes with sequence binding and that is uh, that you have to be aware of partial matches uh, because they can actually bind names. So if you uh, look at this target over here, it's a list, it's one, two, three, four. We're going to match that. We have uh, simply have two uh, um, capture patterns, A and B. They will always match. So we will assign A to one and B to two. Then we have the third element, which, does, which is a literal pattern and it does not match the three in the list. So this uh, case will not match, but we 
we've already bound A and B to one and two, and they will remain bound to one and two even after this failing case, uh, case uh, uh, state uh, case um, uh, uh, ends, while D will not be assigned to anything at all or bound to anything at all. So this is something to be aware of. Even a partial match will still bind the names that, it's, that it has checked before failing. Um, well, um, I have two more patterns for you, and I think we have enough patterns for, the, uh, for this uh, presentation. This is a mapping pattern. So at the top, I make a dictionary. It says name is Sebastian and age is 34. And then I'm going to match my dictionary. Now, this is a mapping pattern. And uh, basically what it does is uh, that it will try to look, uh, is this object a mapping object? In this case it is, it's a dictionary. So that's, that's good, we can match that one. And then we've specified a key that we're looking for, that key has to be present in the mapping. Uh, so we're just going to check, is H, uh, in the first case, is H a key in the dictionary? Well, yes it is. Uh, and then we're going to get its value, and then we're going to compare the value against the literal pattern that we've specified here, which is a 34. And that's it. That's what. That's how a, a mapping pattern works. Obviously, you can use any kind of pattern here for a 34. Um, so, if you look at this uh, uh, match statement, which of the three cases do you think will match? And obviously, by asking you this question, I have a, a purpose with that in mind. Uh, this one will actually match the first one because a mapping pattern does not require that you specify all the keys in the pattern. Uh, it, it just means that the keys that you have specified have to be present. And if you specified some kind of value pattern that is not a wildcard, it has to match as well. So in this case, my introduction, it contains H it con and it has the value of 34. So the first case matches and we're going to print someone's age is 34. And then we'll jump out of it and we will never execute the Sebastian is 34 years old one um, because the first one already match, uh, matches. So in this case, you could say um, that it will match the first case block and that order really matters. So this is also a lesson for you, match the more specific patterns first. So in this case, we're going to match the full pattern first, and then we're going to print Sebastian is 34 years old, and we will never match the second one. Um, so this is also a lesson that I've learned. Try to match the more specific patterns before uh, you match the more general patterns. Um, so the order matters. Um, obviously, you can also use other patterns for values. Here I've used a capture pattern. So I will, uh, I will bind the name H to whatever value is associated with the key H here. And then I can print a nice message. Sebastian is 34 years old. Um, right, and then the last pattern for today, and I think this is the most complicated one, and I'm not going to discuss it in its entirety. Uh, this is the class pattern. So what is the class pattern? A class pattern allows us to check if an object is an instance of a certain type. And it looks like this. We have a class name followed by parentheses. Uh, and this uh, uh, is the syntax for specifying a, uh, a class pattern. So what we can see here, I, I'm making a person object. You can just imagine the, 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 the person class being defined somewhere and that the dunder init method takes a parameter called name. I give that the value Sebastian. And you may also assume that the uh, that, that the object will have an attribute that's now assigned to Sebastian. So this match statement um, will get to the case person, parentheses open, parentheses close. Um, and it will just check, um, is this target an instance of the class name? Now, as you've noticed, there's nothing between the parentheses and the case in, in, the, in the class pattern. And that's not necessary because it's not Python. We're not actually calling the init method. We're not actually creating an instance of person. Uh, this is just a syntax that says, I'm going to check the target uh, for if it's an instance of person. Uh, and, it, and the parentheses just signal to Python this is that, that it's a class pattern and not, for instance, a capture pattern. Um, well, this is all nice and, and well. 
Um, but what about attributes? Can we check for attributes as well? Well, yes, we can. And that will look like this. So here I've slightly modified my person object uh, in a not so nice way, but I just want to show to you that you that that uh, you, you can match by any attribute of an object, not just the ones defined in the uh, signature of the init method. So I set person.h is 34. Then I enter my match statements. I do case person. Then if I open my parentheses, I can specify I want to check for the presence of the h attribute. Uh, and this is called a, a keyword pattern or a keyword attribute pattern. So what Python will do next, it will try to see if person has an attribute called age. Uh, if that raises an attribute error, then it says, well, this pattern doesn't match. So this case doesn't match. We stop here. If it does have an attribute called age, it will then check the value against the literal pattern I've specified here, the 34. And in this case, it matches. So it will print this person is 34. Um, as always, you can use any kind of pattern here to check the value uh, of the attribute. Uh, so for instance, I can also use a capture pattern and this looks a bit weird. So what's going on here? Um, again, I'm going to check if this is an instance of the, the class person that happens first. If it is, I'm going to check if it has an attribute called name and whatever the value is, uh, that the attribute name has, uh, I will bind the name captured name to. No. Um, so in this case, I can print this person's name is captured name. Now this looks a bit weird because the name that we're going to bind actually follows the equal sign. You have to get used to that uh, a little bit, uh, but that's simply because um, this is the way in which the pattern works. So the first part in the parentheses is the attribute that we're looking for. And after the equal sign is just a pattern that we're going to match the value against. And in this case, it's a capture pattern. So the equal sign here has nothing to do with binding the name. That's all because we're using a capture pattern, just a name that we bind to whatever value happens to be here. Um, right, those were all the patterns. Um, I'd like to finish with a practical example. Um, and it's parsing the API response of some kind of search API. And it's a really simple search API. Uh, we send a request with a query and we get back a response. And you can see the response here. It will reply with, uh, it will echo our query. So we know uh, what this response belongs to. And it will have a, a results key in, in, in the JSON payload as well. And that's just a list of all the results that were matching our query. Um, if our query didn't match anything, that list will be empty. There can be one item in it. There can be many items in it. Um, we don't know that yet, but this is the response that we're going to get. So let's write some structural pattern matching to match this uh, response structure. Uh, and that's what I did here. So I make a request using requests to my search.local. I send in the query, hello, I get a response back, and then I'm going to match the response.json. So I'm going to parse the JSON and I get a dictionary, which is a mapping object, and I can use mapping uh, patterns to uh, match that dictionary. So here we get case, query is query. So I'm going to capture the query uh, just to make sure that uh, the search engine understood what I was trying to send. And here in the first case, the results uh, match to an empty sequence. So that means there are no elements within the results list. And then I can handle that with my handle no results feature. I just send in the query because I know there are no results and I can display to the end user there, will no, there were no results for your query. Now the second case, it will also bind the name query to uh, whatever query we, we get back from the API. And then it will also, um, and then it will uh, match the, the, the key results again. And then it will actually have a sequence pattern uh, with just one element in it, which we will match with a capture pattern, which binds the name result to that one result we have in that list. So now we can handle the single result, which probably means that we can display a little bit more information about that single result to the end user. We don't have to display a lot of uh, results in a big list of potential results. Uh, so we have special handling for that. And then the third one, and this one's meant to handle uh, uh, if we get multiple results back, 
So we have handle multiple results here in the block. Uh, we again, we bind query to whatever the uh, search API has echoed back to us so that we can check if, if it's uh, received uh, the, the correct query. And then we uh, use that, um, the, we use a capturing pattern, but a start capture pattern to gather all the results that we have. Uh, and then we display them, display it here. And the last one is just a bare capture pattern if we haven't matched any of the previous ones, we are going to match this one because this is a capture pattern. It will match anything. And which means that we just assign error response to whatever response we were matching. And then we can log an error and uh, attach the response uh, a dictionary so that we can handle it. So this is parsing a search API. Um, so and that's, that's basically the example. Uh, I, I made it really simple, so I didn't have to explain uh, 100 lines of code. Uh, but this is something that you can do with uh, match uh, structural pattern matching. You can really easily parse uh, nested complicated structures by just writing uh, patterns that capture those patterns, that structural pattern. Right, wrapping it up. Um, Yo, I did not change the title. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I think uh, structural pattern matching is a very powerful tool. Um, uh, uh, it does require you to learn a new mini language in Python, which can be a little bit of work. But on the other hand, I think we all like Python. So why not? It's, it's quite fun to do. And I have to say that I've had a lot of fun playing around with structural pattern matching. Um, one final note, I, uh, I did not cover everything that structural pattern matching has to offer. I'd like to recommend you all to just go out there, download the alpha release or the beta release in May and just play around with it. It's really cool. It's really exciting. Right, so finally, um, our next meetup will be in June from the Pythoners on Thursday, uh, 24th of June on uh, uh, quarter past five. And Johan Vergeer will talk about MyPy and he will actually go beyond the basics of MyPy, which will be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I also have myself, I have a talk lined up on PyCon on the 15th of May uh, on uh, a quarter past, past uh, uh, 6 p.m. And I will talk about the magic of self or how Python inserts self into methods. So if you're going to PyCon, uh, if you have a ticket for that, uh, Come see my talk. It's going to be great. So, any questions? Well, thank you for the great talk. Uh, it was quite a handful of insights into Python <laughs> as, a, as a Java de developer myself. And I saw a question coming in in the chat uh, about the uh, the pattern matching, about the, 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 the default that always triggers. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to put it on the on the screen as well. Jan Hein asked a question for the, uh, for after the presentation. Has the asterisk uh, has been considered as a wildcard pattern? So like the default pattern that's now in just an underscore. Uh, why did you choose it? Because I know uh, Java uses the, the default keyword. So what's up with that? So, uh, uh, so I didn't choose it. Obviously, I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I, I did not develop structural pattern matching. Uh, I don't. I don't actually know. I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, uh, what to use for the uh, default case, and they went with the underscore because it already has the meaning of we're not interested in this value. Uh, um, that's what I know. Why they did not use the asterisks? I think because they they were already using it for that. Um, uh, for that packing feature, for if you want to match uh, multiple elements uh, in a sequence. So that's my guess, but I don't actually know. Um, they've chosen the underscore and that's it. So um, I'll look it up and then I'll discuss it with you, Jan Hein. Uh, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. And I, I got another question for uh, myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I saw the, the, with the with the case matchings, it's uh, firstly just checking if there if if it's an instance of uh, of a type or a class. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it will be more difficult for for programmers that maybe just start programming, or th that they come from a language like Java, where it's really uh, explicit, and now it's just well we're, we're just you you put in the constructor and it will 
it will check the instance of it? So, um, yeah, obviously it's not actually constructor because it's this this new yeah. kind of pattern language, but I know what you mean. Uh, will it be more difficult? I don't know. I think this uh, is not unlike uh, how a lot of uh, Python works. Uh, we have uh, things like duck typing and uh, using is instance to check uh, things is really common. So I think you'll get used to that pretty quickly uh, once you start using Python. But will it make learning Python more difficult? Uh, I have to say maybe, because this is a, a, an entirely new mini language that you have to learn. Um, it kind of looks like Python, but as you've seen, it kind of works differently from Python as well. Um, so that's something that you will have to learn in addition to everything else that you have to learn. On the other hand, this is not something that you necessarily have to use a lot uh, when you're just starting out. I don't think uh, we will see this a lot in, in very easy code. It will only come up when once you start parsing more complex structures uh, and with the documentation next to it, I think it's quite easy to follow actually. So I'm not that worried, but yeah, it, it is another thing to learn. Does it answer your question or? Yeah, so, sort of. So it's it's just another thing to, yeah, just to, to add to the uh, to the learning curve. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe. There, yeah, but I I think you can learn. I think you can take some time before you start with uh, structural pattern matching. You don't have to learn this in in week two or three or four. Yeah, or it's on, it's, your first it's somewhere months. on the curve. Yes, it's somewhere <laughs> on the curve. I've seen just another like, question coming in from the chat uh, from Martijn. He mm -hmm. asked. Um, the the you said the variables will be bound even uh just just before it breaks uh, mm -hmm. so what's the scope of the of the variables and how long do they keep uh, keep the value so that's a that's that's actually a very good question so what's the scope of the the the, the binding of the names to the values uh, and that's the same as with the uh, walrus operator the assignment expressions it will just bind the names in the current local scope so the current scope uh, unless you've used a non-local or a global uh, statement before that to elevate the scope of that name. Uh, so it will be in the in the current scope. Um, and it will survive the, the, the match statement, if that's what he means. So it will leak out into the, the scope outside of the match statement because match statements don't have their own scope. Um, and actually, there's, there's another thing as well. Uh, what the implementation leaves open is the order in which case statements are evaluated. It will define it in terms of, well, the top one that matches uh, uh, is the one that we're going to execute, but you may you may execute the, uh, uh, the, the, the matching in parallel if you want to optimize the implementation. So it could be that a failing case after the one that matches still overrides the names. So... I think, uh, and that's quite mind boggling. So I think my, my recommendation is just don't rely on those captured names. Use them within the match statements, but not after the match statements, unless you're really sure of what you're doing. So you're also able to overwrite uh, your global variables uh, within the case? Um, Depends on what you mean by global variable. If you if you're using this at, as a top level statement in Python, which is allowed in Python, uh, then yes, you can override any name which is in that scope and which is then your global scope. Uh, if you're within a function, you you will only assign names within that function scope. For instance, makes sense. And if I don't see any new questions coming in the chat, um. So I think we'll wrap this up. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. And yeah, as I already said, it was quite insightful, even for a Java developer. And <laughs> I, I want to thank you all for watching. And as you can see, the next meetups are coming soon. So make sure to tune in as well. And we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.